Thank you all. <coughs> know me, I'm the Neural Ophthalmology Fellow. Um, I was a little ambitious when I first made this title, so I'm going to have to um, change it just a bit and add that it's just going to be neurologic accompaniments to an ophthalmic disease. <laughs> so, um, so our patient presented with the chief complaint of, I think I have a floater, and she's a 24-year-old graduate student and nanny. Um, we already knew her well because she had just had a five-day history of loss of vision in the left upper quadrant of both eyes. She came in um, from triage and she had been in the ER. She had gotten an MRI scan for this and this was about three days prior to her new chief complaint and basically she was describing almost a kaleidoscope effect in the left upper quadrant of both eyes with loss of vision. And um, so her MRI scan at that time was normal, no sign of infarction, and she had a history of migraines, so that's what we thought was going on, but then, much to my dismay, she calls and says, I have a new problem, and this is a white spot with a blue outline that I see just in my left eye, and I think it's a floater, but it doesn't float. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, her past medical history, as I said, she has a history of migraine um, since 2003, although she's never had a headache, so her migraines um, currently are occurring about once a week, and she gets basically loss of central vision, and then it spreads to take away all her vision, and then she gets tingling on the left side of her body, and then sometimes she has trouble speaking, and this whole process takes about 30 minutes. And then she also has frequent nausea, not necessarily associated with these migranous spells. Um, she has trouble with panic attacks, and her sister, her sister was actually killed in a tsunami in Thailand in 2004, and her mother died from CNS lymphoma at age 40, and so she has a lot of stress and, and panic attack, sort of PTSD. Um, she was started on Topamax and aspirin three months ago by a neurologist um, who was trying to control her migraine spells. And in evaluation for these migraine spells, she had an echocardiogram which showed a patent frame in ovale which was closed, and then after that, she started having the spells three times a week rather than once a week, so she had to get revision of that. And ever since, she's had shortness of breath with irregular heartbeats occurring several times a day. Um, other than that, she takes Maxalt as needed for her migraines, and she doesn't use alcohol, tobacco. Well, she rarely uses alcohol, no tobacco or drugs. On examination, her visual acuity was 20-20. Um, her pupil exam was normal. Motility, muscle balance were normal. Pressures were normal. And this is what she drew on the Amsler grid as her spot. She said that basically um, within this area here, um, she can't see any of the lines. It's sort of just whited out. And then it has like a blue outline. This is her visual field test from the few days prior. And she says that seems just exactly the same, hasn't changed at all. And this is her fundus exam, and it looks pretty normal on, on this photograph, but in real life, <laughs> there was a little spot right around here, and I can show you some more pictures where you might believe me. But, and on red free, she didn't have any changes in her fundus. But this is her infrared, and you can kind of you can see that spot. And um, and we did the infrared just because we got an OCT, but we happened to get the infrared image. Um, so here's her OCT, and um, at first it's like okay, no fluid, but then if you're looking right here, there's a abnormality in the outer retina, and on higher on zooming in, you can kind of appreciate that better. So I think this is like the inner outer segment, um, and then I think this is the outer nuclear layer. Correct me if I'm wrong, retina people, but. Um, so our impression is we have this 24-year-old woman who has a persistent visual aura without infarct, and a new photopsy in the left eye, which corresponds perfectly to this macular lesion. So um, we had gotten the MRI scan, and it had diffusion-weighted images, but we hadn't really imaged her vessels, so we decided, because of this new lesion in the macula and the possibility of maybe um, ischemia, that we'll just go ahead and image her vessels in her brain. And 
so we did that, and then we started thinking maybe something like some unusual presentation of AMPI, just because AMPI is well known to cause cerebral vasculopathies and retina changes. So we were thinking about that. So when she went to get her imaging, I read up on AMPI. And basically, the um, pathophysiology isn't known, but it's thought that it could be due to some kind of um, infectious process that causes some kind of hypersensitivity <laughs> reaction that causes some inflammation in the choroid and maybe a partial choroidal um, infarction and then changes in the overlying RPE. <laughs> and um, we all know that AMPI occurs um, most common in white young adults <laughs> and um, it occurs equally in both sexes and um, they often are preceded by a flu-like illness, and they um, often have changes in their central or paracentral vision. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and on exam, generally with AMPI, you see sort of discrete, multiple, round, um, subretinal lesions, like in this picture. And this is in the acute phase, and in the um, chronic phase, you can see changes in RPE, coarse or, or fine granular pigmentation. I didn't uh, really remember the other ocular findings that can occur with AMPI, like, um, in, of course, well, anterior and posterior chamber cell, but also um, corneal melting, subepithelial infiltrates, episcleritis, um, papillitis, optic neuritis, retinal vasculitis, um, engorgement of the retinal veins, and even uh, vein occlusions have been reported. And the most common neurologic complications with AMPI um, have been headache and CSF pleocytosis, but rarely um, there can be a cerebral vasculopathy, which we all hear about, and um, it, that can sometimes cause a stroke. And it can generally s occurs either simultaneously with the diagnosis of AMPI or a few weeks after the diagnosis of AMPI. So in our patient, that was sort of backwards because she had the brain finding the homonymous defect first. Um, and it can affect the small or large arteries in the brain, and it can also cause a venous thrombosis. And um, there's been one case report of someone who had um, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis preceded by um, AMPI. And so in this uh, literature review that was published in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology, they looked at um, 19 published cases of AMPI associated with cerebral vasculitis or venous thrombosis. And the most common symptoms of patients with um, cerebral vasculitis or venous thrombosis were headache, weakness or hemiparesis, homonymous hemianopia, which is sort of what our patient had, numbness, seizure, and less common symptoms were aphasia, dysarthria, ataxia, stupor, slurred speech, and nystagmus. So um, that same literature review actually looked at follow-up of patients with neurologic complications from AMPI. And, um, and six were eventually better completely. Um, five had persistence of their neurologic defects. And then four had either progression of their defects or relapse um, when their drugs, their immune suppressant drugs were tapered. And um, three actually died. And those patients were, were young men, um, age 23, 24, and 25, who had, um, one patient presented with headaches and seizure and didn't have any neuroimaging and didn't have any treatment. And then one patient presented with infarction of his MCA, received um, oral prednisone and died from cerebral herniation. Cerebral herniation. And then one patient um, had infarction of the PCA and also had oral prednisone and died. Um, and so the ma main recommendations for patients with AMPI and neurologic symptoms would, or headaches would be a brain MRI with diffusion-weighted images, which our patient already had, um, and treatment based on the clinical, the severity of their clinical presentation, so it's corticosteroids if they just have headaches, or other immune suppressive agents for patients with um, imaging evidence of cerebral vasculopathy. So I was already to look at our patient's MRI and see if she had a vasculitis and consider treatment. But luckily for her, her MR, MRA, MRV were all completely normal, and again, her MRI showed no evidence of infarct on diffusion-weighted images. 
so good for her, but we still didn't really know what was going on. And she had um, a hypercoagulable workup that was all normal. Oh, so at this point we decided to um, get the FA, and so <laughs> this is for Dr. Bernstein. We got her autofluorescence first, which I have uh, learned to do, but unfortunately it wasn't very helpful. Um, so we got a, a fluorescein angiogram, and again, this was completely normal, and as was the ICG. And we still had one test pinning, which was serial Ansler grids, <laughs> which we like to do. And basically, her spot didn't change. So um, does anyone have any, any thoughts about what could be going on? We came up with something. Um, I, so I showed Dr. Vitali, and, and so we think that probably she has acute macular neuroretinopathy. Um, and this was first described by Boss and Dutman in 1975. They thought that the lesions were um, affecting the inner retina, and so that's why they called it <coughs> neuroretinopathy. Um, it's rare, it can cause permanent or transient visual impairment, and it can be either unilateral or bilateral. And generally the lesions are, um, are petaloid, and they make like a, a flower shape around the fovea. They're flat, they're well circumscribed. They can be brown, red, or even purple, depending on the pigmentation of the patient's fundus. And they're wedge-shaped. Oh, and they tend to correspond exactly with the patient's Amsler grid. And um, they're most best seen on infrared imaging. So here's a, a patient from just last month in the archives of ophthalmology, and you can't really see too much on the fundus exam, but on infrared, it really stands out. And um, it tends to show decreased um, cone responses on multifocal ERG, which um, kind of indicates involvement of the photoreceptors. And um, so this is just an example from 2009 in the survey of ophthalmology. And on OCT, it tends to show involvement, just like our patient, of the inner outer segment and um, thinning of the outer nuclear layer. Oh, and so because of that involvement, um, some people have proposed to change the name to acute macular outer retinopathy, or amor, which means love in Spanish. <laughs> so, um, and then this is just a picture showing um, resolution of the changes in the inner outer segment over time. Um, improvement, but um, maintaining some thinning of the outer nuclear layer. And that's from Retina from 2011, and this is as well. And this shows um, changes in the infrared over time. This is at baseline one month and three months, and it just shows that the defect lessens a little bit. So um, AMN has been described, this is from a, a review of um, 41 cases from 1975 to 2002, and um, about 80% uh, were found in women, and about 50% of the women um, were using oral contraceptives, uh, which may or not, may not be important, but. Um, and then uh, it was associated with epinephrine about 10% of the time, but about 15% of the time involved epinephrine plus some shock, clinical shock. And then rarely, um, like 5% of the cases involved um, trauma or iodine contrast media. And interestingly for our patient, 7% of the cases were associated with headache or, um, or migraine headache with or without aura. So our patient had the, the aura and she'd been using her Maxalt almost every day for like five days, which, could, which has a sympo, sympathetic um, effect similar to ep epinephrine, so I'm not sure if that was significant or not. Um, so we do all this research and, and everything, but unfortunately for our patient, it doesn't really help with her treatment because there's um, limited follow-up documented, and it, we know that defects can get less noticeable with time, and sometimes they're permanent, sometimes they're transient, and we think there's persistent of the thinning of the outer nuclear layer, but treatment isn't really known, but it's still um, good to to learn about it and also because it's really easily identified I think on on our OCT so maybe with more cases identified we can figure out what the what's going on systemically so.
So, um, any comments or questions? Yeah. No run. Oh, um, no, I don't. I didn't read about like any persistent homonymous defects. Just the fact that. There was a paper from 1975 that talked about auras and associated with AMN, but um, I actually wasn't able to pull that article yet. So, yeah, I don't know about like permanent homonymous defect or anything with AMN. Mm -hmm. She did. She had a closure and then she had a revision of her closure. No, it, her migraines got worse after the closure the first time. They went from once a week to three times a week, and then after the second time, they went back to once a week. Yeah, all ores, no headache. Doctor degree here. Oh yeah. No. I don't, I don't know. Do you know, Dr. Werner? <laughs> oh, there you are. Do any of the retina people have comments? 